Today, we have more new signing announcements as a secret signing has finally been revealed. On top of this, my friends, let's hear where we plan to buy our next football club and we discuss the latest round Ian Matson. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's videos. Hit that like button. Make sure you guys catch my What We Learn video against Crystal Palace. I had to go overtime on that one and I think you guys will definitely enjoy it. So hit that like button, share your thoughts and opinions and without wasting any more time, let's start things off by discussing more news surrounding this multi-network club model. Now, we've known for a while that we hope to buy more football clubs. However, news has kind of died down a bit. Since acquiring RC Strasbourg, rumours suggested that we hope to buy a Portuguese club. However, we aren't hearing any more updates or reports at this point in time. However, to really get this model working, we need to acquire more football clubs. And today we are learning that the club have plans to buy a football club from Argentina. Crazy story, interesting news, but let's break down the reports coming out from Argentina today. And basically it goes like this. The new controversial president of Argentina in Javier Mele announces reforms to the country to open up more investment to Argentina. Basically these planned reforms across the country will target major sectors, including football, and new law changes would allow for Argentinian clubs to be limited companies. Now, the president is actually quoted verbatim as saying that many international clubs, you know, sticking to the football topic, are very interested in investing in the country. And I'm going to read these quotes out for you. As it says, there is not only one issue, first, because there are many investments waiting, but there are many international football clubs that want to invest in Argentina. It goes without saying that Argentina is a cradle of stars, so there is a lot of business to be done with the Argentine case. It could be representing investments of more than a billion dollars. In this context, we are adjusting and need a quick response. In fact, as soon as the decree came out, Chelsea became interested in investing in Argentina, and then it has other types of issues which make up the debate. So the president of Argentina is confirming the fact that you now since these potential new law changes, suddenly we are showing a ton of interest in acquiring an Argentine club to become part of our multi-club network model. It makes a lot of sense. Recently, we have a fascination and obsession with all things South American talents. We've signed many a Brazilian. We've signed one of Ecuador's best ever youth prospects as well too. And we have shown interest in the Argentinian market. Of course, players like Echeverri, who now is most likely to be signing for Man City, and obviously the talented left back at Boca Juniors and Valentin Barco. If we could have a network club in Argentina, it gives us access to acquiring some of the best possible talents. And within this multi network model structure, you can then move players from one club to the next and potentially create the first team Chelsea stars of the future. Now, in theory, on paper, that's the plan, right? That's what everything's built towards. But there are arguments on the other side that, you know, is this good for the future of the game? Because sometimes with a lot of these types of uh, wheelings and dealings in the present right now, you don't see the long-term consequences until many years in the future. Most times when you realize it is too late. There are arguments being made that the super clubs, they're getting too powerful. They have too much money. They're consolidating everything in football. And could we create this fearful future where football essentially is getting tier listed, where all the super clubs already have access to the very best players available, meaning that any other clubs outside of that essentially get the discards that weren't good enough to make out the top clubs. Yes, I know it's a bit far-fetched, but you know, there are some arguments and discussions and debates to be had around this topic. Imagine if we could acquire an Argentinian club, could that allow us to possibly sign, you know, six senior roles from across South America and then move them to clubs within South America? Could that be another loophole we could look to exploit? And with Argentina suddenly being very open to selling their football clubs, I mean, how big a club could we potentially buy? Could it be like an institution like a River Plate? or a Boca Juniors. There are so many possibilities and the fact that it's essentially being confirmed that we are now interested in acquiring an Argentinian club, it does make you think quite a lot of how the future could look for us if this actually goes through and with the potential ease in which we could maybe sign a club in Argentina. So there's so many things to discuss, but I'd imagine that we will hear a lot more of this story in weeks to come. So you guys, share your thoughts and opinions. How do you feel about things? Are you excited by acquiring a potential club from Argentina? Let us know below. So now we move on to the next story. And I guess the secret 
is no secret anymore because we have confirmed yet again another wonder kids at our football club and we finally signed the talented 17 year old Senegalese DM midfield player Mpape Duda De Jong. Now this news was confirmed by Fabrizio Romano but we've known for the past week or two that essentially we're very close to getting this deal wrapped up and finalised. Now we've all seen that photo of De Jong alongside Payas in our cup game against Newcastle United. That was the first time he was spotted there and he was actually revealed by Secret Scout on Twitter. So that was a very nice find that was astute uh, attention from the Secret Chris Scout. Anyway, we've signed him from the acclaimed Senegalese Academy in Academy Foot uh, Jara Salam. And the rumours are not confirmed. Only rumours suggest that we may have paid up to the tune of 20 million euros to sign him. Now, it's not the first time we've thrown crazy figures at teenagers. I mean, we've kind of been known for that in football recently. But um, wow, that is a crazy amount of money to... Uh, spending a 17 year old I guess I shouldn't be surprised and maybe he is going to be worth that because from my research and what I've heard from people it does seem like he is seen as one of the premium talents right now in Europe now of course you know he had a great under 17 World Cup uh, the Senegal under 17 team were very unlucky to lose to France they lost 5-3 on penalties and it was actually Dion who missed the decisive penalty in the round of 16 but Senegal were doing big things in that tournament and that's when he really came to light and as I said in a recent video you know Senegal are producing their golden generation right now many top talents talents like Giamande who we are now looking to try and sign Lamine Kamara is another super talent that's been produced in Senegal who's currently playing for FC Mets I watched my previous news video to find out more information on him and how can we forget probably one of the best young teenage centre backs in Europe right now and that's recent Barcelona acquisition in Fikayo Faye who's doing big things in their uh, academy right now and Talk suggests that we are still even showing interest in the left foot sensation. So Senegal are producing top talents for the future. And it seems with our recent interest and our recent acquisitions, I feel like we're tapping into the emerging markets in football right now. You know, we are looking to acquire the best of Brazil. Of course, we are still planning on acquiring Estefan William, but still waiting to get the confirmation from the player. It seems like Senegal is the next emerging market with the next talents breaking through. And I think it's very interesting that in terms of our youth acquisition, we really don't play around and we know how to sign them. You know, at first seems a bit iffy at times, but hopefully in the future we'll be, we've been proven wrong and all these signings end up, you know, helping us climb up the table. That's what we really care about, right? But regardless, you guys want to understand who is um, Pape uh, Du De Jong? How does he play? What's his game? And why have we forked out so much money to sign him? Well, as you guys have been seeing from the clips, he's an absolute giant. I mean, he looks like he's on that Bellingham type of like freak physicality thing where how many 17-year-olds are looking like him? It's ridiculous. So already... There's a lot of potential in terms of what he can do if he's already physically capable to play at a higher level. Outside of that though, he's acclaimed for his defensive now and reading. Now his optimum position is playing as a DM, playing in front of a back line, marshalling the spaces in behind because he has a very high IQ reading. He knows when to like pressure, when to leave his positions. He's constantly alert, constantly scanning. Those types of details that scouts like. Outside of that too, when he gets the ball, he releases things quickly. When he wins tackles, because he is such a rangy, tall, physical player, he doesn't have to slide in to win tackles. He can outstrength and outbarge most players he's up against, and he uses his body very, very well. So he's not giving away silly fouls either. Another detail that excites. In terms of his passing range, he can pass it over distances and he has a nice very driven technique to his passes which really speeds up the play when he's playing forwards. Um, and he can carry the ball. He's got that press resistance but I think because he's such a unit, not many guys can take the ball off him. And listen, with his potential, yeah, who knows what he could be like in the future. So obviously because he's 17, we won't see him until the summer. And remember, he only joins our projects. That doesn't mean he joins the first team. It would surprise me if, let's say in pre-season, he got an opportunity. But I think most likely he will be going straight to Strasbourg because he's Senegalese, 
French speaking, let them acclimatize to life in Europe in an environment which can ease them into life. And I do think staying at Strasbourg, maybe for the next, I don't know, three to four years, realistically, could be the pathway to go down to. Um, exciting player. Let's see how things go. And it makes me think of details like this year, where it's like, let's say like, you know, deep into the future, like three, four years away, because I don't think we'll be hearing about him having any first team opportunities with us until maybe he's like, what, 21 or even 22, who knows? But could we be opening up a potential future where we may not even be turning to the market anymore because we're literally going to be turning towards the players within our network and just swapping players in that we need and swapping them out and spending nothing. Is this what we're looking to build towards? Listen, it's very ambitious and theoretically it can work, but reality is a completely different story, yeah? So I don't think it's as simple as this, but regardless, we have signed one of the premium African talents, teenage talents right now. Um, I hope you look after him. I hope he does well. Welcome to Chelsea Football Club. And my friends, Give your thoughts and opinions behind this recent acquisition. So right now, let's end things with the final story. And we end things by discussing the latest news surrounding Ian Madsen. Now, some interesting reports are coming out. And essentially in Holland, it's no open secret that Ajax really want to sign Ian Madsen. They see Ian Madsen as a long-term player in the future. They see Ian Madsen as an integral part in helping rebuild Ajax for having a, a pretty iffy, disastrous season by their high standards in the Dutch league and obviously as we know Matson most likely has no future here because he hasn't agreed to signing a contract extension we've been very publicly open to selling him and as we know as well if we hope to sign players in January we do need to sell players produced from the academy because you're getting a pure profit from them and they actually attract the most interest so most likely Ian Matson will be going out the door in January but I do find it very fascinating the type of club showing interest because you'd be surprised by this but what I'm about to say was confirmed by The Athletic and Man City are actually big admirers of Ian Matson alongside West Ham as well now it doesn't surprise me you know Ian did big things uh, on loan last season at Burnley where he was winning, winning awards putting in top performances at left back at left wing back and the fact that he's come back to his parent club and doesn't play in his best position doesn't really help things. Now, pre-season, we were seeing Pochettino first start to experiment by using Madsen as an attacking mid to decent effects. But again, it's pre-season, so you can never take things too far from what you observe there all the time, right? And since the season started, he's had no luck. Even with injuries to your Kukurez, your Chilwells, Pochettino prefers to use centre-backs or even Gusto in that position over Ian Matson, where he's basically been playing there for the better part of his entire career. And when you find out that the manager doesn't rate you enough to play in your best position and he uses you outside of that, what does it really say about your long-term future? So it doesn't surprise me that City would be showing interest in Matson based on his affordability, the fact that he's very versatile, that he performed really well playing under company last season. And there are a little similarities that company has with Pep naturally because that he Pep was his manager for years. So I can see that type of connects. And Man City have always signed those surprise players that end up having great squad roles. So it doesn't surprise me that they'd rate the player. And it wouldn't be the first time that Man City have seen more value in our players than th what we actually see in them ourselves. You're looking at Ake, you're looking at Kovacic. And I think there's other examples as well too. And obviously the famous example being Kevin De Bruyne. I mean, let's see what happens in January, but most likely Ian Matson is going out the door, but it does seem like he has a host of suitors paying great attention towards him. So can we at least earn some decent money from his potential sale? On that note, my friends, that is the end of today's video. Stay tuned for more content dropping tomorrow and then get ready for our game this weekend against Luton Town. If you guys want more Blue Lions TV, I highly suggest and recommend you watch my latest What We Learn video against Crystal Palace. I'm going into detail and I think you guys would enjoy it. So you guys want to find it in the card above and link below. So my friends, on that note, I am the EFC. This is Blue Lions TV. I will see you guys tomorrow. Cool.